every 20 minutes would like sing again on the way home from Florida and it like would not leave my head. Uh, it was some like old Hart and Blake rock song. It was a good song. All right. Welcome back to SwitchCast Live. I'm your host, Doug Tabbitt, and SwitchCast is the automotive-related podcast where we are searching for the truth and the humor in the car industry. If it ain't true, it better be funny. Yeah, here at SwitchCast, it is automotive wisdom with a side of sarcasm, or vice versa, depending on how we're feeling any given week. We appreciate you joining us both live and later on via the audio podcast. If you're here with us live, feel free to throw your comments in the flow of wherever you're uh, watching and enjoying with us. And we'll do our best to get to them, although we do have a very full schedule tonight, a lot of interesting things to talk about so if we can't get to them in the regular portion of the show we will of course have the tip talk bonus round of live q a after the show at around 9 p.m so uh with that said i do want to call out one uh special uh question that we got via switchcast.live about uh inter asia cannonballing um, and uh, it's a regular listener of ours, and they did leave a super chat, and um, I will get to that one next week. That is a uh, bigger than quick answer question, I think, and I want to do it justice, so we'll dive into that question next week. I thank you for that question. It is a good one. I just did not have time to prepare uh, on that one this week because, again, we've got a lot to cover. Um, the first one, we're going to start out on a little bit of a downer note. It is something everybody is, of course, talking about, and that is the Maersk cargo ship, which struck the bridge in Baltimore and, uh, took it down in a matter of seconds. And, um, this is a terrible situation for sure. Um, a lot of people impacted, uh, lives, friends, families, um, and, and, you know, not to mention, of course, the, um, probably longer term impact, but less important because stuff can be replaced. But let's be honest, it is going to be a massive, uh, economic hit for the city of Baltimore and the international trade that comes through there. Um, one of the friends of, of the podcast and a uh, fellow cannonballer um, works for the Maryland Department of Transportation, and they were doing work on the bridge uh, that night. Uh, in fact, if you watch the video, you can see the little orange lights of the, the vehicles and um, you know that went down when, when it hit. And he called off that night because he had a family situation. So, um, you know, we're, we're very thankful that he wasn't on duty that night. Um, but of course our hearts go out to the people that were and, and all the families that are affected. Um, with that said, I do want to talk a little bit just about the kind of implications to the automotive industry, right? I mean, this, this is a car related podcast and there are things that are, are going to be affected, right? So, you know, not just the, bridge replacement 1.6 mile bridge uh, major thoroughfare around Baltimore um, but uh, automotive shipping right so Baltimore is not a huge port in the scheme of, of US ports but out of the 438 ships that used Baltimore last year 113 of them were carrying vehicles uh, it is a major port for all the German automotive Automotive manufacturers. However, some good news in this. Most of the German auto manufacturers have their berth before the bridge. So their supply chain is actually not going to be affected. Um, from what I read today, it's essentially or mostly Subaru, Volvo, Nissan, and Chrysler in terms of car companies that have to go through the bridge. Um, you know, estimates are at least a month from what I heard on when they'll be able to actually like get ships through. Of course, that's just a, a guess. So who knows, but that's, uh, that's certainly going to cause some problems and, you know, they'll probably have to reroute them to other ports and that's going to cause a backup because ports are always busy. I mean, we remember what happened during the supply chain crisis after the pandemic. I mean, ports were just, there was hundreds of ships outside of the Long Beach port, just Sitting there. For weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Just hanging out. <laughs> Just treading water. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and of course, I bought a car overseas yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't supposed to go in there. Right. Now, nah, thankfully, it's not coming. It wasn't planning to come into Baltimore, but everything will. There will be a ripple effect. No pun intended. Sorry, water, you know, uh, but there will be a ripple effect um, on the automotive industry um, for for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, it was very sobering and unsettling and humbling to watch the video of the ship kind of coming towards the bridge and. One, all of the cars and everything on the bridge looking like toys, just scale wise. Yeah. And then when it hit and it fell like it was made out of popsicle sticks and you're like from that distance, you're like, oh, it looks so flimsy and, and weak and whatever. But then you look up close and it's these like massive steel beams that just crumb. So it's yeah, very. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not great, obviously, to look at and then to think of everything. It'll be that everybody who has been impacted so far. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and the guy we know posted when it first happened is essentially like, my job just became hell. And, right, like, that in many ways, just, you know, the immediacy of it, of potential friends and coworkers being directly affected. But then, like, imagine their job in the Department of Transportation trying to manage the logistics for the next however many years it might take to rebuild the bridge i mean this is yeah, a it's huge yeah it's a big deal so and i don't even know how you look at that and say it'll take a month to get all that out of there like I, it's such a large amount of material right. that has now been you know well in, i think that like a month just to like open a lane for shipping right just to uh, clear okay. debris gotcha. and then say okay boats can get through um but i guess apparently biden's already promised money to rebuild the bridge so you know I would think that Marisk would have to pay for it since they ran into it, right? But no, let's just, let's just use government money. It's no problem. Yeah. Just throw it out there. So I understand he wants votes this year, but uh, let's not get into politics tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and quickly pivoting away from that. Right. What's next on the docket? Uh, listener Spotlight. Uh, it's our new segment. Give a shout out to people who deserve a shout out, which is all of you listeners. We're not here without you, but we got a, a, a anonymous package in the mail this week, and it is a green T-shirt. Um, I think it's actually forest green metallic, Ooh, right? I love green. JN3C <laughs> color code. It's a four paint can rare on <laughs> Renbow.org. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you're getting me all excited. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> it's, uh, it says Porsche is two syllables. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. We love it. We love it. I don't know if he watched a video and he's angry at me for this parody one where I call it Porsche and he's trying to correct me or he knows the backstory. There is a backstory to this T-shirt, actually. Is it not the like 944 reel you posted forever ago where you're like, that's Porsche. Yes. And people get so angry because they do not realize it's oh. satire. And they're just like, it's Porsche, you dolt. I'm like, uh, I know everything else I said is completely false too, but apparently you're so smart that you didn't even realize it. But that's the beauty of satire. Um, when I was a kid, my aunt aunt for those of you in the midwest uh but there's a u in between the a and the n my aunt had a white porsche 944 which you know us porsche snobs are like oh this is a crappy porsche it's like 150 horsepower it's nothing you know um but to me that was it was amazing it was the fastest car in the world it was the only porsche i knew and she parked it like in a barn at her horse farm and stuff but it was just it was cool um and she would get the Christophorus magazine. I remember in the magazine, they had a T-shirt that said Porsche is a two-syllable word. And Porsche had all the like umlauts and accent oh, things yeah, yeah. like it would be in a dictionary. And I'm like, that is a cool shirt. And then like 10 years later, I wanted to find that shirt. And I couldn't for the life of me. I just remembered that it was in a Christophorus like 20 years ago. And so, well, so... This one isn't the the one from Christopher's, but I I thank whoever sent it for for that. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Bet you that one wasn't a four paint can rare on rainbow color anyway. So I think you <laughs> came out all right. I do think it's funny though how I guess rightfully so Porsche people are like you have to pronounce it Porsche, 
but then we don't pronounce any other manufacturer the way they would in their home country, right? Like we call it Nissan, it's Nissan. Jaguar, it's Jaguar. Audi, it's Audi. We don't call it BMV, right? That's technically how you pronounce W in German. It's V. So Bavarian Motor Verks. Yeah. I try with most of them, but I feel like if I try too hard with, uh, I'm not even going to say the full name of Jag now because I'm going to embarrass myself. I try, but I feel like I just sound like an idiot. Can you imagine if Corvette people knew that Corvette was a French name? <laughs> Is it really? Yes. Whoa. It's French for little ship. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Your car's foreign. All right. Well, just don't tell Hank. All right. Well, speaking of Hank, I think he's uh, waiting for us after the commercial break. All righty. Everybody, you know that SwitchCast is brought to you by BoxCast. And BoxCast is a live streaming company based in Cleveland, Ohio, and they serve broadcasters and viewers around the world. Their founders launched BoxCast back in 2013 with one purpose, to make people a part of the experience. So if you're looking to live stream your podcast, church service, car show, sporting event, wedding, or even your cannonball attempt, BoxCast is an easy and flexible live streaming platform for organizations. BoxCast is so easy, in fact, that we're broadcasting this show with a phone. So head on over to switchcars.com slash BoxCast to start your free trial. Alrighty, Hank, how are you doing tonight? Fine, thank you, Tyler. How are you? I am doing great. Good. The weather is a turning. I'm drove a sports car tonight it's fantastic did you drive the corvette heck no all right i gotta ask there's a chance of rain and it's probably gonna be below 40 degrees yeah i'm gonna be a little careful going home my tires might be a little hard um mine are original oh that's right still got enough tread on them oh yeah i've only got five thousand miles on it oh that's true so today is not the day for it but i hope at some point this summer i'll see you out in your car i don't do any of them burnouts either like those dumb kids leaving those new shows they have in the saturday mornings Oh, no. Have you seen that in person? Uh, no, never seen it in person. I don't go because there's no classes and, you know, they don't have Corvette uh, parking areas and there's no trophies or anything. So um, no live music either. They got them friggin' DJ bumping things going on. <laughs> That's true. There's a lot of bass. Yep. Uh, but speaking of car shows, uh, I found it very interesting that right here in our own backyard, a, a local Porsche club and the Corvette Cleveland group. Do you, have you heard of that group before? Oh, yeah. Been a member for 20 years. Did you know that the this Porsche club? I'm a member of 13 and, uh, <laughs> different Corvette clubs. Are they all in Ohio? Nope. Do you just join every group that you interact with? Like, how does that work? Yeah, well, you know, I want to get different publications and stuff. And, uh, you know, of course, I write to them and tell them about my car, maybe get featured in one of their magazines. Nice. Have you been featured? Nope. All right. Still well, working hey, one on day. it. You get to frame that magazine. Uh, but anywho, so this local Porsche club and Corvette Cleveland is putting on together a joint car show. Why would they do that? Well, it's all to raise money uh, for the Hudson Wise Foundation, I guess. Okay. So uh, the Hudson Wise Ass Foundation, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> so uh, there's a twist with this show. Uh, it sounds like there's a <laughs> twist already. There's going to be German cars there. Yeah, but I think the next part is what you're really going to like. You, you ready? So free food. <laughs> well, I don't. Maybe trophies. I didn't actually check that. Yes. So there's going really? to be judging and and winners and and like class winners, like best in show. Oh, which kind classes? Of stuff. Uh, they don't give the full details. I don't have I don't to compete think. against one of them fancy rich people with their Porsches, do I? No. But those fancy rich people with their Porsches will be judging the Corvettes, and the Corvette owners will be judging the Porsches. I'm not sure how I feel about this. I got. I got. I got to digest this one a little bit. How much does it cost to enter? Uh, that's a great question. I should be, I've got the email pulled up, but I don't think the price is on it, actually. I would have to go elsewhere. So I. Hmm. Well, I, I didn't get anything in the mailbox today, so I guess I'll check it again tomorrow. Yeah, this came from the Porsche Club. I don't know when the Corvette Club is going to be uh, distributing their stuff, but I mean, it's sure. probably. Well, maybe like at the next quarterly meeting. Yeah, well, this event is taking place uh, in May, so that would probably work out. Okay. So would you... Are you taking your fancy Porsche there? Uh, probably not. Why not? Well, I'm not I'd one... like to judge you. <laughs> would you? I <laughs> would. Uh, well, we'll have to talk later. You can go out and look at my car. I'll you can... make you a deal, Tyler. <laughs> okay. I'll bring my Corvette there if you bring your Porsche there. Oh, all right. Ethan, you better write this down so we, we can tell him you can't... But only that. if it costs less than $20 to register. I'm pretty sure that we can make that happen. All right, Hank. Well, I will see Wonderful. you in May uh, Great. at wherever this is at, and I'll judge the heck out of your car. 
You better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other thing. Yes, uh, I was whoa, about whoa. ready to go. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, before you go out, I'm sorry I might upset you. Uh, have you heard that GM is selling uh, driver data to insurance companies? What? How do they get that? Well, there's all these computers in cars now that can track how you drive and where you drive and is or do you drive fast and brake intensely, and they're selling that data to data brokers that then sell it to insurance Well, companies. I don't drive above the speed limit in my Corvette, so I don't think I have anything to worry about. Also, it's a 1998. I think it's old enough. But yeah, uh, I don't, think you I don't know. A... My wife's Envoy, you know, what do they do it through that... Uh, that uh, OnStar thing? It, it It's not OnStar itself, but it's an OnStar service. So you might want to go check out, see what I, paperwork you ooh, signed. Uh, I think I better go home and uh, make some wiring adjustments <laughs> to my wife's car real quick. All I right. don't want them friggin' spying on me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Hank. I hope that goes well. Uh, that was Hank, everybody, the Corvette curmudgeon, who's brought to you unwittingly by the Corvette Buy Sell Trade Group on Facebook. That is your source for cranky boomers, overpriced Corvettes, and reinforced stereotypes. Hank uh, alternated saying Porsche and Porsche. I couldn't help but notice he could, he couldn't pick one. You know, I probably I was should responding have called him to out. him <laughs> saying Porsche. Hank was sorry. Yeah. Uh, whoa, wait, whoa. Hank, <laughs> Doug, you just got back from taking a break. <laughs> Fourth wall is gone. <laughs> it's been gone for a long time. So yeah, let's talk about this thing where GM is is selling driving data. I, I read about this and. Allegedly, they are doing it without the driver's knowledge or consent. Yeah, that part is a little weird. Uh, I've seen that, and I've also seen that there have there were pushes during the purchase of the car to just sign this extra piece of paperwork that actually signed the folks up for this, but they didn't know what they were signing up for. This is all allegedly. But. Sure. There was a journalist that like went through the process, though, and was basically like, I don't see any clear... There was nowhere that it was clear that I knew I was signing up for this. Yeah, that's so. That's wild. Well, and I saw too. So uh, there's a couple of different articles that I've seen uh, that have kind of followed up on this. The, there's one from the New York Times that says that uh, there was like an internal document that the Times got a hold of uh, that showed as of 2000, 2022, more than 8 million vehicles were included in this smart driver program. And the yearly revenue from the program was in the low millions of dollars hmm. without this whole data broker business on top of that. Right. So interesting. But GM has promised to stop selling the data to two specific data broker companies. <laughs> Did you notice that? No, I didn't. But I feel like them promising is kind of like Kim Jong Un promising to like stop building nuclear weapons. Like, yeah, take my word for it. Yeah, so their, their statement, uh, again, pulling from New York Times, uh, says OnStar smart driver customer data is no longer being shared with LexisNexis or Verisk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right. Um, said some spokeswoman in an emailed statement, uh, customer trust is a priority for us and we're actively evaluating our privacy processes and policies. Hmm. This is why my newest car is a 2014. <laughs> I remember when insurance companies like piloted this program, but it was optional, right? Like you could ask for, and it was, it was selling you on the fact that if you are a good driver, then your rates will go down. So the reason people got tipped off to GM doing this is their rates went up like out of the blue for no reason. They're going, well, Hey, why did my rates go up? They go, well, cause you suck at driving. How do you know? Well, GM told us so. <laughs> yeah. your car tattled on you. But with with the insurance company, they'd like send you an OBD two port and you'd plug it in. So yeah, and they had like fun names for it to make it like a game where you could save money and right. I always thought when they did that, I'm like, I always thought that would be really funny to get one of those and plug it in during a cannonball run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like, what are they gonna do with that data? <laughs> what were you doing? Yeah, What's happening? Your insurance is fifty thousand dollars a year now. <laughs> Oh, in you, other somewhat unrelated but related news, uh, Porsche is going to stop selling the Boxster and the Cayman two uh, years before its EV replacement is scheduled uh, because its electronic infrastructure does not comply with the European Union's anti-hacking or cybersecurity laws. Tyler, this is right up your alley, uh, Mr. Software Engineer. I, this I, I understand this is the the way the world has gone and there's been computers and cars for a very long time and now the computers do more which I don't like because I feel like it makes it less of a car 
But the fact that a manufacturer, regardless of what manufacturer it is, has to stop selling cars because their their internal infrastructure does not meet these cybersecurity rules? This is ridiculous. I mean, can't they just put some like like lace some tin foil <laughs> wires into the glass? You know, just I make it a dead zone inside. I don't know what's. I don't know exactly what the details of this are. It's I'm just so depressed. I don't want to know more (laughs) like this is they can't sell these cars in their own country because of this. It's like just insane. And it I I just I don't like that cars are computers. Cars should be cars and computers should be computers. This is another good plug for one of my favorite books of all time, which is Matthew Crawford's Why We Drive. And he goes into this concept of the self-driving car, the autonomy, and how it has nothing to do with the convenience of it, but it's it's that um, consumers are no longer the customer, they are the product. Because our data is being collected and sold, and the companies, who the advertising companies, are now the customers. And I'm not going to expand more than that, but that, go read that book. If you're a book reader, it is fan fantastic. But man, we, we are, we're going there. This is like the automotive 1984. Well, and so this, I had a question that I wanted to ask to you. And I think for us, you know, like you said, the newest car you have is a 2014. Mine is a 2010 with cars becoming relatively reliable from, I guess I'll say, the nineties up until the low 2010s ish. And I would say relatively safe as well. Yes. Crumple zones became a thing. Uh, Lots of airbag thing. Like my 911 is from 2003. It's got side impact airbags. It's got two in the front, like the whole crumple zone business. Like the A pillars aren't as fat (laughs) as my Volvo, but you know, it's probably fine. Um, Do you think there will be a trend for niche folks like ourselves to keep older cars on the road for longer? Yes, because I've got like 130,000 miles on my uh, Volvo and I've been thinking, well, maybe I should replace it soon ish. I want something that I, you know, I don't really worry about it on road trips, but it's getting older. It's been driven in salt. Why would I bother Yeah, (laughs) to get into something that's more computer than car that can raise my insurance rates that is going to be crap to drive? It's going to be less reliable because it's more complicated with some hybrid system that's turbocharged and supercharged and all this other crap. Well, there's a lot of designed obsolescence now, too, because I think automotive manufacturers are uh, following the Steve Jobs model of the thousand dollar iPhone. You know, these cars are going up and up and up in value, but it's it's all on payments. Right. Just just lease, just lease perpetually, you know, just turn it in every three years and we'll scrap it or whatever. You know, it's. Um, and just in the last three to four years too, I mean, new manufacturers have, their quality has been going way, way down. So I think there is going to be a shift to even like five to six year old cars for a lot of people. Um, but, uh, anyway, we, we must move on. Uh, but in moving on, we're going to move back as well. Uh, cause I, I did want to highlight a, a Corvette curmudgeon esque, uh, listing, that Ooh, I, f- yes. I I didn't find it. Uh, Matthew Davis, a good friend of the podcast, uh, Captain Chaos, sent this one to me, um, and uh, it it is a listing on Facebook Marketplace for a Corvette car twin bed. Now this was something I always wanted. I I it's always like wanted the, a Corvette or a car bed when I was a kid. Like that little text one. <laughs> it's all like plastic no, with step the steering two. wheel. Oh, step okay. two. Yeah, it's a it's a real bed. But I was I was very confused by this listing because. It was completely straightforward, factual, and helpful, right? So I'll read you the listing. Quote, Corvette twin bed in great condition. Great for ages 3 to 10 by step 2. Size is 8 by 4 by 22. Weight limit is 160 pounds, which, side note, I I could fit in that. (laughs) Extra medium Corvette bed. Anyway, uh, comes with 11 bin shelf, $250 firm. Now, I read this and I thought, wow, that's all the information I could ever need. But whoever was selling this was obviously not instructed on how to properly list a Corvette-related item. Oh, okay. Right? So it should have read, for sale. Wait, 
sorry, nope, all caps. <laughs> For sale, rare 2007 Corvette Z06 3LZ package, twin bed, and torch red metallic. One of less than 350 produced this year in that color. Has only been hand washed with Lysol and clean microfibers. The sheets are original to the bed. Only slept in by one mature child. This bed has never been wet. <laughs> Always covered when not in use. No trades, no dealers, no lowballers. I don't need help selling. $250 firm, cash in person. No test naps without proof, proof of funds. God bless. What, have the sheets been washed? That's like the only thing I got out of all of that. If they're original to the bed, please tell me they've been washed. <laughs> they've been changed every five <laughs> nights. Uh, yeah, so that... Did you th buy it? No, it was sold <laughs> by the time I saw the listing. But it would have been good for my man cave for when I'm in the doghouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> Put in the garage next to your actual Corvette. You can go curl up out there if you <laughs> piss off Aaron. <laughs> and when you have friends over and they or get just drunk, when I want to. You know, well, I <laughs> Aaron's uh, always complaining that I hog the sheets and the blankets and all that. <laughs> think she's she'll probably say you can have that bed. <laughs> it's it's the old saying, right? People are like, well, you can't drive your house but you can sleep in your car well now you can really sleep in your car get a corvette bed oh amazing <laughs> all right please if you enjoy this podcast help us out with the algorithms if you like subscribe share review etc whether it's on spotify or apple Podcasts or youtube or facebook please do all of those things throw in comments tell your friends all of that helps us out it helps other people see it we do not really advertise at all this is all word of mouth and we've been growing and we appreciate it and ethan our producer just let us know that uh, we are up to a five star review or five star average on spotify which is fantastic that is all you guys thank you thank you so much um yeah so if you want to make a difference go leave us a one-star review because that'll actually change our average but we'd like you not to make a difference just keep piling on the the five stars <laughs> i love that people like to listen to whatever this is some nights it's amazing i'm baffled and amazed <laughs> but thank you for coming back ah uh, so yes let's go to a commercial and then we want to get to our main point of discussion topic of discussion for the evening Celebrity Machines is a proud sponsor of SwitchCast. Celebrity Machines offers more than 250 different screen-accurate license plates as they've appeared in movies and TV shows, such as Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, uh, Fast and the Furious, Breaking Bad, and so many more. Celebrity Machines also makes our dealer insert plates, as well as our commemorative 2539 plates from the fastest cannonball run ever. Visit CelebrityMachines.com for more info and use promo code SWITCHCAST to save 25.39% at checkout. Welcome back to SWITCHCAST. We are talking about all manner of automotive news tonight. And one article, this is the, the main topic of our podcast tonight, uh, I found an article on The Atlantic, which is a pretty fantastic website with opinions all over the board and seemingly well-researched stories. Um, this particular article was probably a good half hour plus read, but it is well worth it. And this is about the DC Solar Ponzi scheme and a guy named Karpoff, which is ironic. We got Karpoff and Madoff. Bernie Madoff with billions and this guy Karpoff got some cars and uh, i don't know anyway <laughs> um so this guy he was a mechanic in in california and he came up with this idea to put solar panels on trailers so you could like take them around to events and you'd have mobile power not a whole lot of power because they're stinking solar panels but whatever so some customers of his uh saw the idea gave him a bunch of money to make some prototypes and 
one thing leads to another, and he figures out he can sell these things to large companies because of the incredible tax credits that were available to these companies um, for buying alternative green energy stuff, thanks to our government just handing out money for stuff that fits their agenda. Side note, let's not go down that. Uh, We've already trail, resisted it once, Doug. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> so he figured out that he could sell these things with the help of a, a law firm in, in, I think, New York. He could sell these things for essentially like five times their retail value, selling them for $150,000, a, a trailer with solar panels on them, $150,000, so that these companies could get immediate tax credits. And they would only pay up front the amount that was equal to their tax credit. So it was literally a dollar for dollar thing. Instead of paying the government 30 grand, they just pay him. And then he would also promise that he would lease them out to companies that would actually use them because the companies buying them didn't actually need them. They just wanted the tax credit. So he would lease them out and make these companies back some ridiculous multiple on their investment. I mean, the whole thing was a too good to be true thing. Like anybody with a sense in their mind working for these companies should have been like, these numbers don't make any sense. But they didn't. Um, he scammed companies like Berkshire Hathaway, Sherwin Williams. He scammed major banks. He scammed the government. He was endorsed by the White House. And even though the IRS looked at the numbers and said, this is crazy because I think they valued his his trailers at like $13,000 or something, like thirteen or sixteen grand, And they're like, he's basically just milking the system. Um, the nobody else caught on because of the nature of the investigation it was like sealed right so they like docked i think it was sherwin williams that they find and then that was it nobody else knew about this investigation um so the the problem was he wasn't actually making the trailers he was making a few most of them didn't operate very well and these leases that he claimed to have were fictitious. He would hire his old college. Well, he didn't go to college. He would hire his old drinking buddies and high school buddies and just pay him exorbitant amounts of money to fabricate leases to show that th these companies that they were leasing their units out. If the companies wanted to audit the stuff, he would literally be like switching VIN tags to make it look like he had more than he had. They would bury GPS trackers in the middle of nowhere so the companies could quote unquote track their devices, uh, you know, their, their solar panel things. Um, yeah, it was it was friggin' nuts. I also uh, read that he would like it was some companies really, really wanted to know and they really wanted to see them for themselves. So he, they would like trailer the handful of them that did exist around to like catch up with these people yes. and like show face. Right. Somehow this backwoods mechanic was one step ahead of giant companies the whole way, the whole way. And maybe it's because they were giant companies and horribly inefficient. But if I had any, like if I suspected it and I had GPS trackers on my units, I just go out and check on it. I wouldn't like, yeah. Well, I think, too, what's <laughs> kind of crazy tell is... tell them you're going to check. These companies are so large. That amount of money per each solar uh, trailer unit, it was, like, honestly, probably nothing. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it was, but I think the contract, the initial contract with Berkshire Hathaway's subsidiary was, like, $1.2 billion. Oh, God. One contract. Now, that didn't get totally fulfilled. I think the total value of this Ponzi scheme was around $800 million. But... He got really, really close to getting caught because he was totally out of money and he was robbing Peter to pay Paul because what he'd do is, in typical Ponzi scheme form, he'd land a, a new deal where somebody company would agree to buy you know, 500 trailers and then he'd use that money to pay back some of the other guys their lease payments to say, look at all this money we're making. So he continually had to sell more and more deals and he was just about out of money. This was all like the jig was up. And he there was a company that was basically like, we don't believe any of this is real because you don't have actual leases that 
show you're doing what you're doing. And they paid a T-Mobile employee a million dollars to sign this contract that T-Mobile was leasing, like, I don't know, a couple thousand of them or something like that. And landed this big deal, even though this company did their due diligence. So basically just like blew the company up right at the point where they were going to get caught in their scam, blew it up, built this massive corporate center, bought a baseball team for the city, like just went crazy spending money. Uh, and it took another few years before the feds finally got win. I think it was a securities and exchange commission that, that figured this out 10 years later. Um, and, and, you know, sent him to jail. Well, and it seemed like something too. reading through this article, which you're not joking, took me at least half an hour to get through. I think it was dense. Uh, it started small and then like all of these things just kind of kept getting bigger and bigger. Like it was a little scam here, a little scam. And I don't even think it started as a scam necessarily to begin with, but it wasn't a good enough idea to really grow. And then I was like, oh, this money's really easy. Why don't I just yes. do this other thing? Yes. And, and and there's a couple takeaways from that. And, and you make a very good point. Um, and it was illustrated in that at his sentencing, he wanted to like speak to the judge. And so he made started going off on this big statement about he was just about to turn the company around. He was just about to land this deal. Like everything was just about to be legitimate. And, you know, then he was essentially blaming like the government, blaming his advisors, blaming these big companies like, oh, well, I'm just this mechanic. They all know way more than I do. So, you know, it's really their fault for, you know, bringing me along on this and, and saying it's valid because I don't know anything. I just have people advising me. And the judge, thankfully, just cut him off in the middle of this and said, you're selling air because he was, he was, and, and the reason we're talking about this tonight, it's not an automotive scam, although it's trailers, right? Okay. Trailers are automotive. Those hope but, to cars. <laughs> <laughs> we got the link. They, this is directly related to a number of things we've talked about in the past with CNC exotics, with, um, the uh, European Auto Group scam with Direct Auto Tennessee with Charles Harris with so many of the scams we brought up with Fred Ashmore and the Cannonball thing. Every single one of those people and this Karpov guy have something in common. And it was what what you said is he may not have started out going, I am going to run this scam. Which some of them do, right? Some of them, that's all they know. But it is what you are willing to do when things don't go the way you want, right? Like if you start out and go, I'm going to start an investment company and your investments go bad. Instead of going, shoot, they went bad. I'm out of money. I lost my investor's money. I have to tell them and I've got to go bankrupt or start over or whatever. You go, oh no, I can, I can fix this. I'm going to fudge this, fudge that. And that is what the guy did. He made choices all along the way to falsify VIN numbers, to falsify leases, to pay people off, to hire people that he knew would do what he told them and not ask questions to the point that when he did hire a couple actual like seasoned business people they lasted like a few days or a few weeks because they saw through all of it and they're like i'm out of here well isn't that part of how it got brought down is there was some guy that they hired who saw some stuff and then left in the middle of the night and it's not i don't think it's ever been proven but it's alluded to in some documents that that guy is the one that brought the info to the sec yeah yeah i, th I think so and it, because it was an anonymous tip and of course he doesn't want to be credited with it so yeah, for sure. but it's it's highly likely that that's what went down um but you know if you've listened to any of our past episodes we've we've talked about quote unquote uncovered a bunch of scams in the automotive industry and you know, they're all the same. It's the victim mentality. It's somebody else. Somebody else did this to me. I'm a victim of my circumstances. I'm a victim of these people. And like, that's the classic mark of a scammer, right? It's they double down. 
they keep lying. It's 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 the narcissistic tendency and it's the scammer tendency. And you know, it's it's yeah, maybe you made some bad choices, but you chose to make those choices and that turned you into from a failure to a scammer, right? It is okay to fail in the car world, but for these people it's not okay. Like yeah, and then it gets it almost gets its own momentum, and then you know the you get addicted to the money. I think that was the other thing is like the dude was flush with cash for right. so long. We'll talk about it in a little bit. The list of cars he had was yeah bananas yeah just in quantity. And I think it. I mean, whether or not they're delusional that things will work out, or at some point they just realize, okay, I'm going to get caught, so I'm going to keep this going as long as I can. But they think like well the ends justify the means right if if this works it doesn't matter if i cut corners along the way because it'll all work out but like that's what separates people of character from people of not character is what you do when the chips are down when things aren't going the way you want them to um but i also i also want to parallel this to carvana before we get there to- it is <laughs> I'm Pull not the saying, stock price. disclaimer here, I am not saying that Carvana is a scam. I never have. We just look at their financials and go, this doesn't make sense. So Whoa. get that on the record. But there th- there are a lot of people who are uh, defending Carvana and saying, listen, they've been around for X number of years. They're publicly traded. They're this, they're that, this, you know, Chase Bank invested in them these things wouldn't be true if they weren't a real or a good company or if their financials didn't make sense and i go i don't care how long they've been around look at this guy he ran a decade long billion dollar scam it doesn't matter how long you're around that doesn't mean anything that just means you're really good at kicking the can down the road so yes, Carvana may survive. They may figure things out under the guy under what we just said, like the ends justify the means. They 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 got out somehow and, and made it work, and they may, but just because they've been around for 12 years doesn't mean that they are a good company or that they are legit. Just because Chase Bank loaned them three billion dollars to buy Odessa doesn't mean that their financials are sound. Chase may have just seen an opportunity and said, we're willing to take the risk, or they may not have done their due diligence like people didn't with this Karpov guy. So you can't trust those metrics to say, this company is okay, this company is good. You have to actually step back and look at it and go, does does it pass the gut check? Which if any of these companies had just done that, they would have been like, this is crazy. Like, just look up the blue book on solar panel trailers, right? Like, what's the NADA on that? (laughs) Call Kelly. Has it ever been in an accident? <laughs> oh gosh! Uh, if the for those of you who are keeping track, the Carvana stock price is currently at ninety dollars, up twenty percent in the past month. Goodness gracious! The more we talk about, it, the more it goes up. <laughs> Hoy! Uh, so this guy uh, had a ton of money. He bought a yes. lot of cars. Yes. Uh, so I found a lot of other people's money. It, well, yes. Um, so I found this article. Uh, the title, Karpov Seized Auto Collection, headed to auction on Martin Martin Gazette something. Did he sell them on Bring a Trailer? <laughs> Ew. He didn't have any trailers to bring. Um, <laughs> so I, I looked through this, and there's like a, uh, there's at least 100 cars, maybe more. Like, there's a ton. So all of this, his collection got auctioned off, and this was, you know, everything was done, said and done with. But I kind of summarized some of it uh, that you might find interesting. Uh, so there was 13 uh, Dodge Ram 2500s. I'm assuming all Probably white. to tow the trailers. To tow the trailers yes, around. Okay. Uh, there was five silver Chevy Volts, probably for some other business purpose. Yeah. Maybe he uh, needed his own like tax credit. Yeah. All the money he was like making. Because they're all silver. Like they're all the exact same. That's random. Uh, four uh, Humvees, like early 90s Humvees, one of which has like a farm truck bed that like has the sl- wood slats and stuff. Looks like it's okay. for, like t- t- hauling around hay bales. Sick. Uh, 12 Camaros, of which six of them are the between 67 and 69. So like everybody's favorite. I have a feeling cars. this guy liked NASCAR and voted for Trump. <laughs> oh my 
God, it's nuts. Oh, yeah. Didn't he sponsor a NASCAR? Oh, yeah. Or there was some too? huge yes. thing. Like, he is an all American dude. Five Eleanor styled Mustangs <laughs> by different companies Gosh. and in different colors. <laughs> Probably four of which companies were a scam and are now <laughs> underwater. Sure. Uh, eight <laughs> Plymouth Roadrunners. Oh, my goodness. Uh, more Challengers, Chargers, other Camaros, and American staples that you can shake an American flag at. How um, many of these cars did he buy on TV at Barrett Jackson? <laughs> it's probably all. Like, it is a Barrett Jackson. I wonder if we could go back and, like, find, <laughs> like, search the VINs. These sold at Barrett Jackson. Like, see this guy up there. Like, yeah, on I'm, TV. I'm, I'm the <laughs> solar guy. He was apparently on an episode of Counting Cars, which used to be on History Channel with like a bike, a motorcycle that he had like the Constitution or like the, the first, I don't know, some le- on like the rear uh, fender, like airbrushed on. I tried to find it and I couldn't. But Interesting. Like, um, he did have some non-American stuff. Uh, seven random and tiny All Fiat's. All employees, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know what an Autocraft Panoramica is? I know what Autocraft is, but I don't know what panoramic tiny itty bitty little people's cars i guess okay uh a bentley continental gts that was pretty cool uh a singular dodge viper (laughs) and my favorite thing out of the entire collection is a jag uh xkrs gt there are like 30 of these in the world and one of them ended up in this dude's collection and the only other british car he has other than well, he's got a bentley another jag and then this but everything else is like americana trucks Interesting. in normal like 50s cars and like crazy uh, i mean that tracks that tracks that, that makes sense stereotypes it, it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, the building that uh, we bought for switch cars back in 2016 was bought out of receivership and the guy who had it before had an electrical contracting company and he ran it into the ground and it was kind of like a Ponzi scheme at the end. There was a lot of family embezzling money and a lot of banks and government agencies not getting paid, but he was buying cars and bought a million dollar Prevost RV and he left his car collection here or, or he stored them here and when the receivers came in, everything that was here became theirs, regardless of like if it was titled to him personally or his company, uh, because it was in the facility. So he had like a you know Dale Earnhardt Monte Carlo and a yeah. Buick GNX and like stuff like that. So it's like a smaller scale of this Karpov guy. So the same look. If I had that kind of money, I'd have a bunch of Porsches that a lot of people think would look the same. I think <laughs> so. I can't judge <laughs> <laughs> those in glass houses. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, let's hear from Nuts for Sticks and then do our uh, final segments and move to uh, Tip Talk. Yes. Switchcast is also brought to you by Nuts for Sticks. Nuts for Sticks is a brand celebrating the manual transmission in all its forms. So forget about the flappy paddles because we like shifting ourselves. Check out our fun and funny stick theme shirts at NutsforSticks.com and save 10% on your order using the discount code SWITCHCAST. That is NutsforSticks.com and code SWITCHCAST. Awesome. Um, I do want to highlight an upcoming event uh, in Minerva, Ohio, September 14th of this year. It is the Cars of the Stars event. Every year they feature a movie and have cars surrounding that movie. Um, This year it's going to be the Cannonball Run movie, and we will have some fantastic cars uh, or their likenesses that were in the movie. And we will also have a display of record-breaking transcontinental vehicles from, well, since 1903, which was when the first record was set all the way up to the present. So if you're interested in cars, in the Cannonball Run movie, in Cannonball in general, or just want to come out to a good event, mark that on your calendar, September 14th in Minerva, Ohio, for the Cars Are the Stars event. Uh, you can get more information on that at MinervaMotorClub.com. Uh, the Shrewd Negotiator, brought to you by Vin Wiki. It's been a while since we've looked at a kit car. We went on a, a quite a tear there against some bad kit cars for a while and people keep sending us uh kit cars and we love it and uh pete jackson sent one to us this week so tyler what do we got from pete uh we have a 1986 porsche 359 
Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, 356 and 959 mashup. I, that's kind of what it looks like. So for those of you Perfect. listening, it honestly, it has like a 356 uh, windshield, but it's definitely got a 959, a very poor 959 body kit. Probably has a 356 motor too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let's take a look at the description. Uh, so this is uh, yeah convertible driven 1500 miles. So it's brand new. Uh, Porsche kit car on a Volkswagen chassis. It's not even a 356. I mean, let's be fair. 356 <laughs> is on a Volkswagen chassis. Uh, oh, hey, here it is. Uh, needs to be finished. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> like every other kit car. Never heard that one before. Uh, wiring lights. For every dash, time I heard that, I can uh, finish my kit car. Seats mounted. Oh wait, hold on a second. It doesn't have a motor. No motor. How was it driven 1,500 miles? Fin- I think it needs to be started. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's just a chassis with a motor, and it's got, like, the ugliest rims from 2001 that you'd see in, like, a really, like, it's, like, got a midnight club. Okay, do they want more or less than ten grand? Uh, Less. Okay, well, all right. Well, well $8,000. It's fine. I've seen less for more. <laughs> I don't, I think you'd be better off sending, setting $8,000 on fire. <laughs> That looks horrible. Probably. <laughs> but you probably could with the bad wiring in that <laughs> yeah, car. <that's> true. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally. Yikes. Uh, speaking of no motor, uh, another car with no motor. Somebody posted a photo of a Mustang Mach-E this week with the Ohio vanity plate, no motor. <laughs> I don't think they understood. Uh. You know, it's like they just flew a little too close to the sun there. All those EV folks on their vanity plates about, you know, LOL gas. Like this just so they, close. They do love their vanity plates more than like Baptist church people <laughs> yeah. and and uh, Pontiac oh. G8 owners. But yeah, uh, no motor. I'm so like, close. It's, uh, it, it is, but it is. What do you think an electric propulsion device Doug, is called. Doug, you're using too much logic. <laughs> That's literally what it is. My wife gets mad at me when I say the car, a internal combustion car has a motor. She's like, no, electric motors are motors. It's an engine. I'm like, no, all engines are motors, but not all motors are engines. Anyway, uh, it is time for the props and flops brought to you by Switch Cars. And Switch Cars is the enthusiast dealership where we buy, sell, consign, service, and store only cars that we like ourselves. Check out our handpicked inventory at switchcars.com. And Doug, what's our pick of the week from the Switch Cars inventory? Pick of the week is one I drove tonight. It is a 2003 Jaguar XK8 white over white with 25,000 miles. I thought Hank drove that. No. (laughs) But if this sounds familiar... Because it is. We've had this car before just six (laughs) months ago. Uh, A a loyal listener and fan of the podcast, uh, one who sent us some Buffalo Trace last week, Jim Ryder, uh, traded it in. He switched cars uh, and kept his woman, so he earned a T-shirt there. Um, But uh, he traded in for a Porsche Cayman. He's super excited. Uh, So we've got this beautiful Jaguar back in stock just in time for spring. Now, our flop of the week. The Gunther Works Turbo Mule was wrecked badly during testing at WeatherTech Raceway at Laguna Seca this week. Uh, Patrick Long was driving. He is okay. Um, Listen, wrecks happen, and this is proof that they Is that like 100%? What's that? Is that 100%? Yes, he's fine. Okay. Well, yeah. no, no, no. It was that he was driving. It was all like a legend yeah. last time I saw him. As far as I know. Anyway, but, you know, this is not to shame him. The wrecks happen. They happen to the best drivers. Like, they're testing a car. They're pushing it. You know, this is not to, to poke fun at the wreck. But there is an interesting discussion to be had from this that uh, I, I think is compelling. Um, it, it rolled over. And uh, the roof was totally collapsed as the car only had a harness bar. Um, And a lot of these older Porsches are being resto modded and have a lot of horsepower. This particular one has over 750, although it was detuned for testing for reliability. And I I think that, um, I mean, not just Porsches, but old Mustangs, old T-Birds, people are putting Coyote motors in them and LS motors and everything under the sun. And it's 
kind of dangerous, right? Like these cars were not built with crumple zones and their A pillars are, you know, skinnier than a, uh, you know, fashion model that's got. Come yeah. on, you can do it. <laughs> Eating disorders. I'm not supposed to say those things. Um, anyway, um, lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but like, you got to upgrade the safety along with the performance, right? So like roof has been using an integrated roll cage for decades. Singer uses them on their DLS and their turbo car. Um, but Gunther works in a statement, build these as street cars, right? So their statement in response to the accident says, quote, nor was it equipped with a roll cage as we do not fit them to customer commissions with the emphasis on the cars being road going and not race cars. A harness bar with harnesses and an FIA rated seat was used during the test. The car was also fitted with a fire suppression system, end quote. Somebody astutely pointed out on the internet, though, that while they claim, oh, no, these are these are street cars, they go, well, you're advertising on your Instagram posts all these different track lap records, right? Um, so which is it? And they even offer, they offer a touring sport and track package as options. So I have the feeling that an enterprising lawyer may have a field day with this one sometime in the future, but who am I to say? I mean, I just, I, I think if you're going to put seven, 800 horsepower in these old cars, 500 horsepower, whatever, like you got to you got to upgrade the safety stuff too, right? If you're going to do fire suppression, if you're going to do a harness bar harnesses and give people like an illusion of safety, you got to friggin' strengthen the A pillars in the roof. So I don't know. They'll learn. They'll learn. Our prop of the week. Safari conversions are all the rage now, especially with Porsche people. Um, because you can drive them to cars and coffee and, um, I don't know, spray some mud on them before you go. But, uh, <laughs> although I shouldn't say that most of the guys who bought the Lee Keen safaris do actually drive them off road. Um, Alan, Tom friend of ours, um, does drive the crap out of his. He's put so many miles on it since he converted it to a safari build that he's rebuilt the engine like oh. and like repaired rust and stuff like he drives his all the time it is awesome um but there's for every one of those there's a whole lot of posers that don't it's like the g-wagon thing right it's like i like hopping curbs and <laughs> running over valets um but uh <laughs> one enterprising mechanic took the safari build to a new level with a first gen viper rt10 and this information was courtesy of the drive.com uh, the, the put a lift kit on it and giant tires and suspension, custom suspension, a lot of manufactured parts that he had to, to machine for it. Uh, but one of the best things about it was he said essentially that it didn't make it any worse of a car to drive. <laughs> like in no way did I compromise the handling characteristics of this car. Oh. And I'm like, okay, I know the Vipers are bad. They're not that bad, but I still thought it was pretty funny. So I give that guy props for thinking outside the box with a Safari build. I do like that in the article, here's a quote from the saying, well, you know, off-road tires, the sports car, to increase road noise, but uh, it was as loud as a monster truck anyway, <laughs> so it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, the Vipers are definitely loud. Definitely loud. And the first gen car, like it doesn't come with a useful top, uh, no windows. You have side curtains, um, no power steering. It's, it's pretty Spartan to begin with. So making it a off-road monster truck is pretty cool. And, and the architecture of the engine is a truck motor as well. Ah. Don't say the Viper engine is a truck engine cause you'll annoy people that know better, but, um, this is its true calling. It's going back home. Right. <laughs> right. 
Uh, anyway, thank you all for joining us. If you're watching live, please stick around after for our bonus round tip talk for all the rest of you. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our official supplier of banter and co-host Tyler Sanders, to our producer Ethan Huffnagel, our sponsors Boxcast, Nuts for Sticks, Switch Cars, Celebrity Machines, Parallel Printworks, and Stephen Holm Woodworking. Our bumper music is provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud. This episode will be available next Monday in audio format wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out switchcast.live for your up-to-date SwitchCast information. Subscribe to our newsletter, submit a question, or find past episodes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. as we look forward to edifying, educating, and entertaining you on the drive of your life. All right, Tippy Talk. Hey, Send I did. Those questions. Uh, I did see that that uh, I talked to Hank about this uh, Corvette and Porsche car show. Uh, the tickets are twenty bucks a piece. Hey, <laughs> so <laughs> he nailed it. <laughs> Look at that. I think we might be seeing each other on the show field. Um, alrighty. So from YouTube tonight, uh, let me see. I've got some stuff from last week, but. How about we... Oh, so Cars of Coffee Bridgeport asked earlier tonight, is there still going to be a Switch Cars grand opening event this summer? I remember seeing a post about it on Facebook, but can't find it anymore. I mean, we've been open for <laughs> 19 <laughs> years. <laughs> Do you know what they're referring to? Uh, <laughs> grand opening of our new website? <laughs> yeah. Shameless plug. Uh, please clarify. <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zane Price asked, are there any good police stories lately or recently? Any good police stories? Uh, Ohio State Police, Highway Patrol, sorry, not State Police, got uh, new Durangos that they use for patrolling. They're like a green-gray color. They look pretty stinking cool. So um, any actual interactions? I don't think so. Not really. No, I've been staying out of trouble. Driving the speed limit. <laughs> I'm is that, sorry, is that, that was tough to say with a straight face. I could do Hank all night long, but... <laughs> you got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> uh, Burrito Bowl 01 asked, is anyone selling a 997.1 turbo manual? Yes. I have a feeling you might be able to find one. <laughs> oh, ah, we way undersold one a few months ago, and I'm still salty about it, but it's my own fault because apparently... Me, the Porsche expert, doesn't pay attention to the Porsche turbo market well enough. But uh, anyway, I do not have any available, but there's probably seven on Bring a Trailer and one on P Car Market and 10 or 20 on Cars.com and Car Gurus and Auto Trader. They do all see, always seem to be some around. Yes. <laughs> you, get your, you get your pick. They are not rare. They are out there. What? Whoa. That's a, that's a turbo, Doug. It's got to be rare, right? No. Uh, I, I, we have one from Instagram here. Instagram, you mean you have one good up. one from Instagram? We've, Rather, yeah. right? <laughs> Thoughts on the uh, 2019 to 2020 GT 350R, one of the best sounding and drivers cars of all time? Yes and no. I do like how that flat plane crank v8 sounds it's got a real snap to it uh i do also think that it sounds a little bit synthetic right like these manufacturers are almost over engineering their engines and their exhaust notes now to where i'm not sure what's real and what's not um but it does sound good really good uh it does drive really well i've never had a chance to put one on track through its paces i drove one on the street i've driven a few on the street and to me it was kind of disappointing on the street because in everyday driving it felt like you had to be driving that car at 11 tenths for it to be exciting and driving around at four tenths on the road just like it was disappointing right like that's the problem with with new sports cars is they're so good that they're bad. You can't have fun at normal speeds. That's why a lot of people are going to older, more engaging, like quote unquote worse cars, but they're at least fun because you can feel stuff. And um, 
Is the, uh, we'll call it the normal GT350 any more of a road vehicle? I don't, uh, maybe, but they're both so good that they just need to be on back roads or on the racetrack. Like, I only want to be driving that thing sideways, and you can't on the street. And, and the, well, the limits are so high, too, right? If you have a 90s Corvette with original tires, it'll slide around a little easier, so you can kind of, like, ring it out and not pose an immediate threat to anybody around or risk of jail, right? And, you know, you can slide it through a corner and a, you know, school bus is passing you on the outside. But with these cars, you have to be going so fast to to break them loose or have any kind of fun. It's just like it's it's not fun anymore. It's scary because if things go wrong at that speed, they go really wrong. So especially if a cop's there. <laughs> Uh, Cars and Coffee Bridgeport clarified uh, there's an open house on July 31st. Oh, no. I had posted an Instagram story for like uh, 30 minutes back in January. And then I think Dan actually told me like, hey, I think you mean January 31st. <laughs> and so I deleted the Instagram story and put it back up as January 31st. Um, so, yes, we are having an open house on January 31st, 2024. <laughs> we will have more events, though, so keep an eye on our social media. Thank you for asking. I, apparently, people are going to show up on July 31st. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> That'd be pretty, uh, could be a good time. Uh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, G. Smith says, have you purchased a vet lately? Have you driven a Ford lately? <laughs> um, sorry, that's what my mind heard when uh, I heard the cadence of the question. Have I purchased a vet lately? Not for myself. I haven't bought anything lately for myself. I mean, that's okay. You're just really enjoying new, new what you bathroom got. cabinets. Ooh, that's tell cool. us more about that. Yeah, let's talk yeah, about. I that. could buy a Corvette C4 for <laughs> the same price. Oh, Good man. golly. Uh, nope, no Corvettes. There's one I've been trying to buy for like six or seven years. I'm not going to tell anyone what it is because a few people know what it is and where it is, and I don't want them chasing it, but. We'll chat. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. It's not a 98 Corvette pace car, is it, Doug? No. All right. Oof, so no. close. My dad called that a purple billboard to me once because he's like, can't be, can't hide in that. <laughs> it has like the same graphics scheme as a 997.2 GT3 RS. It does, which we were just complaining about before the But show. a purple GT3 RS is worth $80,000 more. Yeah, oof. Actually, no, it really isn't. Let's back up on that. Because purple's paint to sample, a purple GT 997.2 GT3 RS now is worth like $250,000 more. Yeesh. I bet those guys with their Corvettes are really feeling it. They made the wrong move in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> Bought a new for 35 is worth 30 in the wrapper. <laughs> uh, DOA Garage, I think they've asked this a couple of times, and I got to be honest, I just want to know who the heck this is. Uh, has Alistair Begg been sent a shirt yet? Oh. Oh, uh -huh. Alistair Begg is our, our standee who models our shirts some weeks. Um, I don't think he wears t-shirts in 20 years of knowing him. I've never like, I've seen him wear jeans that's, that's even and like a, a yeah. polo shirt but that's as dressed down as I've ever seen him. Yeah. But I mean, he might not know that switch cars has new merch in stock. But that's true. Yeah. But he's also had the same BMW Z3 for the last like 20 years. So he, he does enjoy that. He doesn't, he's that a one. keep your woman guy but not a switch car guy <laughs> <laughs> he's that man but oh really yeah i that's... feel like i just somebody's gonna be angry that i don't know who that is no. yeah uh, is he gonna be doug <laughs> 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 uh apparently there is still a post on facebook about that july 31st event that maybe should get deleted I don't I'll know. Try to find yeah, try it. Try to find it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we're having one on July thirty first. What is uh what is the day of July thirty first? Wednesday? Thirty first no, thirty first Wednesday of twenty twenty four. What day is July thirty first on twenty twenty four? 
It is a Wednesday. Ironically, so is January. All right. Um, Well, well, fine. Maybe we'll just have an open house. Let's do an event on July July 31st. 31st. Let's call it now. Sponsored by Cars and Coffee Bridgeport. Uh, Run YouTube. Yeah. Sure. Cars and Coffee. (laughs) Let's do a joint event. Bring all your people up here. (laughs) Well, it's on our calendar. It's on. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I think I got a couple more. Uh, are there any popular sports cars that you wouldn't list or consign out of self-respect? Something that you think all of them are lemons. Well, I sold a Yugo twice, so <laughs> all my self-respect is gone. Um, yes. Uh, I'm trying to think. We had one recently that we said no to it's not always the car itself a lot of times it is a combination of the car and the condition and the history right um the mclaren mp 412 c i would be very very cautious of and hesitant to consign um hmm hmm i don't know we have a toyota corolla out there so do you really? <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. So maybe I'm not telling the whole truth when I say we only can sign cars we like. <laughs> oh. It's it's a good advertising line though. No, there I there are some that I just don't like um, I don't want, but usually it's more a matter of condition. That makes sense. Uh Eric Marquez asked uh whoop, no, that uh, well, he asked, uh, what do you guys think of the Turbo V6 and the new GX versus the hybrid system in the new Land Cruiser? Yes, both based on the new Prado, which I don't know what that is, uh, right. but still, thoughts. Mm. Uh, it's too pedestrian for me. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just not as a snob. I just I pay attention to sports cars and like the regular traffic I don't know much about. I see cars going down the street, and I'm like, oh, that what is that? Is that a Nissan? Oh, it's a Toyota. I don't even know. I can't tell them apart. Like yeah. I, just, I don't pay attention to almost anything made in the last five years, but especially pedestrian stuff. I feel so bad. Our, our mutual friend, Josh, has texted me on multiple occasions like, hey, dude, I saw you in traffic and I waved and you didn't wave back. And my guy is normally driving some rather <laughs> normal cars because <laughs> he's a normal human. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just he texts you, I saw you in traffic, and you text back, I saw you were traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I feel bad because I'm like, I wasn't ignoring you. I just don't get, like, you know, a, a white SUV doesn't turn my head. <laughs> right. Right. You have to memorize uh, which of your friends drives <laughs> yeah. cars. Is that him? No. Is that him? No. Is that, ooh, ooh, is that him? And you're awkward I'm doing just a like, half wave, like, hey, 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 hey. scratching my head. Uh, hey, oh, fixing my visor. And, <laughs> it's, like, it's like when you go in for a handshake and you just get stood up and it's like, ooh, fixing my hair. Oh, man. <laughs> Worse when you go in for the the handshake and they give you a hug and your hands going down <laughs> the center and ooh, it's like yikes. One yeah, <laughs> inadvertent contact. Oh, uh, righty. I think <laughs> that's uh, what that's what. Sorry, <laughs> inadvertent contact is what people do on marketplace when they accidentally hit the contact button. Yeah. Hello, is this still is available? This still available? Uh. <laughs> Inadvertent, Inadvertent contact, contact sounds like a 90s action movie or something like they're like, oh. Or a garage band, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be a great, that's a good 90s alternative <laughs> band name right there. <laughs> that's contact. a new, that's our new name for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've well, thoroughly gone downhill. We'll see you next